It's my privilege to welcome back to the show Dr. Michael Savage. Uh, those of you know, who listen to the show know I'm kind of a young guy, but I've been following politics 24-7 pretty much since I was about 18 or so, and a lot of it was listening to talk radio obsessively. And one of the legends uh, approaching godlike status in the talk radio uh. dial is Michael Savage, who was just in July inducted into the National Radio Hall of Fame Award. Congratulations, Dr. Savage. That's very, very nice of you. I mean, we, you know, we're in a business where no one compliments anyone else. It's very nice to hear from you. Uh, obviously, you know, as an older guy, I mean, it's nice to hear. But the truth is, there's a lot of people doing great work right now. I'm sorry, including all of you folks at Breitbart, and and we're trying our best to awaken a, a sort of a dead or a comatose electorate. Well, someone who's been very good at that and seeing the tea leaves, reading the tea leaves, uh, has been you. You've been one of the people who saw the Trump revolution coming, maybe even before Donald Trump saw it, which is quite something. Uh, your new book out, Scorched Earth, Restoring the Country After Obama, it's it's out now. Uh, I'm reading it currently. I'm actually listening to it. Um, people, It's an open secret that one of my keys is that I listen to audiobooks obsessively while I walk around and drive around, while, while I walk my dogs. I also read uh, your book recently, Teddy and Me, about your oh. dog, uh, uh, Teddy, which is a, a picture book. But I really liked in that book how you got into some of your history, your evolution coming from New York to the big success that you are now. So that's another one people can can pick up. Uh, but it's a I have, I have questions on the book, but let's start with overall. Give us your assessment of the race right now. It looks like things are turning, but you and I, we spoke briefly off air. We both expressed the same concern that maybe people were tuned out and are just tuning in a little too late. Well, grandma's slip and fall certainly has awakened people to the fact that she's a sick candidate. And we're not worried so much about her illness, whatever it may be, although that certainly is an issue. We're worried about her, her social sickness her desire to do worse than Obama's done. I mean, he brought in 10,000 Syrian Muslims or such. She wants to quadruple that. Why? What, what is in it for, for this country? Does anyone have an answer for that? So let's say I'm an immigrant son, which I am. I'm probably the only person in the major media who actually had an immigrant father. Great. What does that make me? I have one foot in the immigrant world and one foot in the nativist world, so I can see both sides. I know what it's like to be poor, uh, speak a foreign language, not fit in, feel uncomfortable, etc. Didn't stop me from fighting every day of my life to achieve success. I never hated America. I wanted to be America. So how do we go from wanting to be America to hating America while taking its money? The answer, my friends, is not in the tea leaves. It's in Barack Obama and the entire illegitimate leftist Prague establishment. Here is a man who, let's, let's just stop the hyperbole. I'll do that very happily for your intelligent, cynical, sarcastic listeners who don't believe a word that I'm saying. Let's make it simple. Let's talk about disease. Let's talk about immigrants and epidemics. Let's talk about the fact that when the Zika virus was, was found primarily in Honduras, I was railing on my radio show, you can stop it from emerging in America. You practice the first rule of epidemiology. My doctorate, by the way, is in epidemiology and human nutrition from the University of California at Berkeley in 1978. I know the principal rules of epidemiology. The first thing you do is you find the locus of the epidemic and you stop it right there. So, so you say, okay, don't bring in any immigrants, no travelers from Honduras. They may have be carrying the Zika virus. Did the CDC do that? Did the NIH do that? No, they are the politicized arm of the Obama administration, the, the weaponized arm of the crazy progressive policies of this illegal, crazy administration. So what they do? They didn't stop travel to and from Honduras. In fact, they escalated the number of Hondurans being allowed in under fake asylum uh, uh, claims. And what do we have now? We have a Zika epidemic emerging. Well, let me tell my dear friends in the elite, laughable left-wing establishment microbes do not discriminate. They don't know that you're better than I am. They don't know that you're not one of the untouchables or the deplorables. Microbes don't know that you're a good progressive who loves them. In fact, you might get Zika. You might get tuberculosis. You might get one of the other, many other illnesses that your wonderful immigrants are bringing in, both from South America, Central America, and the Middle East. So, okay, just on the basis of ration, <laughs> rationality, 
You don't bring people in who are sick, but he does. Why? Why? Either they're stupid or they think only of the illegal alien voter. That's all they're thinking about. They don't care about the population. In other words, they think that they're above the zoological order, that what they're doing to this country on the basis even of immigrants and epidemics will never affect them. Really? Well, now we see grandma claiming that she has, what is it now, pneumonia? Where'd she get the pneumonia all of a sudden? Is it exhaustion or is it from hugging one of her illegal aliens? Perhaps she shook Nancy Pelosi's hand after Nancy Pelosi washed the feet of one of her, uh, her immigrants to show what a pope she was. Okay, so the, the fact of the matter is, Prague policies are insane. Liberalism is a mental disorder when carried to this extent. Hey, I'm a compassionate man. I give a lot of money to animal groups to protect animals from unnecessary pain and slaughter. The fact of the matter is we all have to have compassion for the downtrodden, but not at the expense of the general population, not at the expense of our own survival, not at the expense of our own sanity. So that's a little bit of the background. But Alex, before we get into the election itself, I want to ask the cynics who listen to your show on uh, Sirius XM a question. Those who listen to you saying, I don't believe a word that Alex says, nor is crackpot guests, but I listen to, the, <laughs> just to hear just to hear what they have to say. So all of you cynics, and believe me, I like skepticism. I've used it all my life. It's a very good methodology of weaving your way through this crazy world. Listen to me carefully and answer the question to yourself. Under Obama, is America not resembling a third world nation of terror, riots, mobs, and chaos? Well, let's check terror. Have we forgotten Orlando and San Bernardino and all the other places that he failed us? Yes, he failed us, and he didn't even fire the head of the DHS. Mr. Johnson, J. Johnson, any corporation would have fired a man in charge of anti-terror work who permitted these acts to occur, especially when we heard, Alex, that the individuals, let's look at San Bernardino, who conducted that atrocity, slaughtering innocents, uh, the two wonderful Muslims, who did this, were on their radar. They were watching them, and they did nothing. Why did they do nothing? W w what's that about? What do you mean? And Orlando, they knew who did it. They were watching them and did nothing. Okay, so, we, yeah, let's check terror, Michael. Sure, Savage, yeah, terror, yes. Riots. <laughs> let's look at our good friends in Black Lives Matter. Yes. Uh, wonderful people, really downtrodden minorities. They gave us Ferguson. They burnt half of Baltimore to the ground. Yeah, check riots. Mobs, well, well, the latest one there in, in Milwaukee, that one wasn't even about a white cop shooting a black man. It was a black cop shooting a black criminal, and they still rioted. Well, there you go. What better way to show your love for, for your neighborhood than burn it down? Uh, mobs, check yes. Chaos, check yes. So America is becoming a third world nation under the progs. Another question, Alex, has our Constitution been trampled by this divisive president? How many different ways can I say yes? Have progressive policies and open borders poisoned America? Can we check yes? The, the real question is, are we one bad election away from losing everything? I think yes, because Hillary has said, America wants change. Grandma's been screaming, America wants change. From what? From what? From progressive policies? So how's she going to change the progressive policies of, of Barry? Oh, she can make them worse. She's going to be more progressive. So what sense, sense does this make for anyone who wants this nation to survive another 10 years to vote for, the, for, the, for Grandma? Now, you know, let's go to the other side. We know he's a flawed candidate. I won't even say his name. We will say the Republican candidate because the minute I say the T word, people's radar goes up. They've been so poisoned uh, by the never Trumpers who pose as conservatives that you can't even say his name. Of course, they're working for Hillary. They make believe they're not. They claim that they're purists. The fact of the matter is we have only one choice now. We've got to take it. And then we've got to keep his feet to the fire. We've got to try our best to make sure that the group around Trump, should he win, and that's a long shot, does the right thing and not stab us in the back the way Boehner and McConnell did after we put them back in power. And that's why I wrote Scorched Earth, to be honest with you. It's an architectural plan, not only as to what uh, should be done, but what must be done if Trump wins. Because believe me, once they gain power, they're going to forget the people who put them in power, and it's going to be up to us, the people, to make sure that they do what we want them to do the best we can. And that's going to be a big, big job, because we see already which way Trump is going. 
We see already uh, he selected Woolsey to be a CIA advisor. How? Why? <laughs> he was the CIA director under Bill Clinton. Why couldn't, why couldn't Trump have selected a current military veteran who had been high up in military intelligence as his advisor? Or General Flynn? Why didn't he select General Flynn as a CIA advisor? Why Woolsey? Who, who's pulling that string, Alex? And then the child care message of yesterday with him with his daughter, Ivanka. Well, what's that about all of a sudden? All of a sudden, big government is now Trump's mantra? Okay, so I say flawed candidate. So I'm not expecting to get 80% of what I want in terms of what I believe in from uh, the Trump administration if they should win. Right now, if I got 50%, I'd be happy. But that's better than zero, isn't it? Or less than zero, which we'd get on the grandma? It certainly so that, is. That... Uh, Dr. Michael Savage, by the way, he's my guest. He's a nationally syndicated broadcaster, best-selling author. His new book, Scorched Earth, Restoring the Country After Obama. You've already touched on a lot of the key themes I wanted to get to with you, Dr. Savage. Uh, but w one of them, let's just talk, let's just go from the top, is that you've made the theme of your broadcast, which are extremely educational. Uh, I listen to the podcast personally, and I try to miss as few as possible. Uh, you've made the theme of your broadcast for years, Borders, Language, and Culture. And this is very resonant right now because borders have been the top issue of this race, at least right of center. Uh, and the fact that the Republican Party, not just the Democrats, the Republican Party want open borders and they want it openly and they brainwashed us. And the second component is, is culture, which is that the left has taken over these institutions. And this appears early on in the book. You talk about how we're focused on the Electoral College. The left is focused on taking over institutions with Gramsci and the other people from the Frankfurt School that Andrew Breitbart was obsessed with himself and how they took over the establishment in all of these cultural institutions, which allowed them to brainwash us. So these are two two of your key three themes are what this election is all about. And I just wanted you to reflect on that. Wow. You mean, is it really all about borders, language, and culture? Yeah, that's that's the question. That seems, that's the race. It, it is, from my vantage point, is this is the, the borders, language, and culture election. Well, let me answer it in a, in, a, in a kind of collateral way. There was an article in the Left Wing Salon in April by Robert Henley that shocked me. It was entitled, The Talk Radio Godfather of Trumpomania, What Michael Savage Can Tell Us About America's White Working Class. Yeah, let's talk about the white working class, where he says the alienation of the party's elite from a huge portion of its base stems from a deep sense of betrayal these voters feel at the hands of Republican politicians they sent to Washington. And he goes on, you know, just like their Democratic colleagues, these GOP incumbents cashed in on public, uh, on for, cashed in on their public service, like Hillary, to make fortunes as lobbyists doing the bidding of big business and even of foreign interests, pushing global trade deals that dismantle tens of thousands of factories and idled millions. OK, at the same time, this disaffected base of white males watched as the national government bailed out the banks, squandered the military, abused veterans, built up China and ran up the national debt in the process. Now, this is written by a, a liberal in Salon, Alex. So what he's saying is this, and I'll just quote one more line, long before Trump's arrival on the scene, it was conservative radio talk show host Michael Savage, the ideological godfather of Trumpism, who galvanized this insurgency. Savage gave it a voice and a powerful narrative, one that proved extremely helpful, blah, 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 blah. So it goes back to what you say. Years before Trump, Savage had already redefined the nature of the American political landscape when he blew up the Republican Party establishment's hold on its working class base. Trump can come and go, but this insurgency has a depth and breadth that can't be ignored. And I've been, I've been quoting him. And here's a, a, um, a blue-collar liberal who says, I've been a long-time listener to Savage. That's what he said. He makes believe he listens because he wants to hear what the other side has to say. But that's not why he was listening, this writer. The reason he was listening is he's one of the disenfranchised white males who has been pushed aside by the emerging... Uh, I don't know how to put it. The emerging what? Who are these people who are doing this to America? 
Why have they crapped on the white male? Let's not forget, Alex, this is really emotionally important for me. I call the, estra the estranged white male in America who has been dismissed as garbage as recently as the other day by Hillary who called them or us deplorables. As the son of an immigrant, someone who grew up with a working father, a blue collar, so to speak, father, who struggled every day of his life, I identify very closely with who I call the Eddies. And let me remind the listeners to your great radio show that it was the Eddies, the carpenters, the plumbers, the accountants, the, 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 the average guy, the Eddies, who put down their tools and defeated Superman in World War II. If it was not for the Eddies, we'd be speaking German, or half of us would be lampshades. It was the Eddies who defeated Superman. It's the Eddies who's being crapped on right now by Hillary and her verminous supporters. I feel myself getting angry just thinking about how they dis disrespect the backbone of America. Forget the heartbeat of America. It's the backbone of America. Bill Clinton gutted their jobs, deported their factories to China for profit. And what does she want to do now? They're all celebrating. I love how they celebrate that soon America will no longer be a white majority. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that a wonderful thing to look forward to if you want to make it all about race, which is what they seem to be doing? Do you know that Obama gave a speech last week in, I believe it was Laos, where he actually said to his audience in his hate tour, uh, by 2050, which is not too far from now, America will no longer be a majority white nation. This is what the president says in Laos? Why is he saying that? Where is the psychosis in this man coming from? Well, that's a study for one of your psychiatric, uh, a guest who's a psychiatrist. I'm pretty sure I know what it is. It's this fact that he has uh, a mother of one race and a father of another, and he tried to kill one side of himself. But that's for another show and another time. I Actually, I'd like to write that essay. I think it's pretty clear to anyone who studies him and Copernic what that's all about with the one knee job. So what is, what is it that they hate about the white male? What is it they hate so much? Does anyone know? And by the way, while we're talking about that, how did it work out for South Africa uh, after the whites were basically thrown out of power? Is it a better nation or is it more dangerous for all, including black middle class? And speaking of that, I can tell you right now, the black middle class is not voting for Hillary Clinton. They don't want to empower the thugs in Black Lives Matter. They live around, they ran away from them. You know, take it from someone who left the slum. Nobody wants to be dragged back into the slum or have slum dwellers ruling over you to make it very, very clear. So the, the black middle class who was never heard from by the Wolf Blitzers and the Jake Tappers and the George Slime on all of us types, the black middle class doesn't like what Obama's doing to this country. They've worked their way out of the slum. They don't want to be dragged back into it by empowering uh, those those people in in the Black Lives Matter movement and the and the white communist liberals behind it, the George Soroses, gave them seventy million dollars. Why would this evil emigre George Soros be funding the 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 enemies of America? What is he doing? Do you think he really likes them? I have a theory on that as well, Alex, as you can well expect. Soros knows more than we could ever imagine what crimes he has committed in my estimation. And what better way to keep the mobs away from your criminal acts than to keep giving them money to destabilize a society and making them think that you're one of them. It's practiced here in the Bay Area by the Feinsteins and the Pelosi's in my opinion. That's why they're all progressives. You think they believe a word of it? This is how they keep the activist mobs out of off their doorsteps just by funding them and distracting them and, you know, sending them down the wrong road. So, okay, what does that have to do with the election? Well, along comes Trump. We know his background is that of a social liberal. I believe he's probably a fiscal conservative. I think anyone who makes a lot of money has to be. In fact, I think anyone who makes a little money is a fiscal conservative. I know young kids who make thirty, forty thousand a year who are fiscal conservatives. All they got to do is look at their pay stub and suddenly they give up their liberalism on a fiscal level. Uh, who wants to pay more taxes other than, than a maniac? 
Can Trump win? I guess we have to talk about that. Well, the illegal aliens, the electronic voting, uh, the vermin in the uh, Soros movement who are fighting every state who has voter ID laws, I don't know. Who knows what might happen? And then if she wins, what's going to happen? Would you still be in business? <laughs> Didn't she declare Breitbart one of the uh, She did. She said, yeah, well, well, not only are we part of the deplorables, presumably, but she said that in a fundraising email that Breitbart might not have the right to exist specifically. Well, that's right. You're a member of the alt-right. That's right. She has that almost right because she meant all right. She, she changed the T to an L, she would have it correct. Yeah, th it's also inconvenient, uh, Dr. Savage. We publish about 1,000 articles a week. We've written 12 on the alt-right, or at least we had on, on that point total in the history of Breitbart. So, but yes, but the, you see the way they brand things. But they can do that because they have, uh, and this is funny, I'm mentioning this too, because they, they call Breitbart Trump's Pravda. Well, it's it, don't don't you think what the mainstream media does for the Clinton aren't the New York Times and the Clinton News Network aren't these places the Clintons Pravda and Barack Obama's <laughs> Pravda? How come no one identifies that? How come people because on the they, right are identifying us that way but won't talk about the liberal media that way? Because they control the media and they control the dialogue. Of course, they're going to demonize those of us opposing them and and tell the average moron what we're not and never explain who they are. Of course, that's their game. The question is, how many dumb people are there out there? The answer is, I think, more than we would imagine. You know, uh, th this is apropos, list. by the way, Dr. Savage, and I want to plug the book again, Scorched Earth, Restoring the Country After Obama. You had a very powerful segment on Putin uh, early in the book where you discuss some of the things that the left accuses Putin of doing, and you say Barack Obama does all of these things. <laughs> you don't get me started on Putin. And how they've demonized them. You know, we had a Cold War that went on for 50 years. It was more or less dissipated when Barry became president. And all of a sudden, late in Barry's regime, about two years ago, they decided to demonize Russia, calling Putin Hitler. She called Putin Hitler a few years ago. Oh, that's great. That's just what we want now is not a Cold War, a hot war, maybe a nuclear war. Is that what they want? Isn't Putin and aren't the Russians our best allies against Islamic fascism? Of course they are. Why would you demonize the best possible ally that we could have against ISIS, for example? And by the way, it wasn't until Russian pilots started bombing ISIS positions that there was any kind of turn in this, pic this fake campaign of Obama's, this wag the dog fake ISIS campaign. It was only when the Russians started knocking them to hell that we saw all of a sudden Mr. Obama was a great war leader. So I don't know what this demonization of Russia is about. I mean, I've speculated on it in a previous book. I think it has almost nothing to do with his policies in Ukraine. And it has a lot to do with his social policies towards a certain uh, demographic, which I'd rather not mention. And uh, it's very personal to these people. He is the last holdout if you want to put it that way, for traditional Christian values. I don't know if people know that, but Russia has a very strong Orthodox church, and they're pretty old-fashioned, if you want to put it that way, and they really don't approve of certain lifestyles in Russia. They're pretty harsh on them, and that seems to be some of the animus towards Putin, by the way. That's almost nothing to do with anything else. I know it says, what, really? Yes, yes, it's that personal. It's that crazy. And they're that oriented towards irrationality owing to uh, certain sensibilities, to put it in a more uh, esoteric way. But I don't want to get distracted from all of it. Yeah, uh, I, I, I wanted to ask you to speak to another issue that I see at play here in this race. And uh, uh -huh. it, it speaks to your effectiveness as, as a broadcaster, as a, you've got a couple of qualities uh, that are unique even in the broadcasting world, which is which is you're fearless and and you're an individual. You don't have you can tell that you're reacting to the headlines and to history each day, and you don't have anyone informing your viewpoint. And there's a war that's going on in this country on the American individual. The the, the 
the pressure to conform at every turn, to agree with mm. cool kids on Twitter, uh, mm. and to not think for yourself it is very frightening to me as someone who was told that diversity is important. You're starting to see people classified and categorized in a way uh, unlike anything I've seen in, in my life. And Trump sticks out from that. Is he is and an individual and i think that that's part of the reason why everyone is so shocked in washington that he's risen but you at your perch in the bay area was not shocked uh not to say you think he's a he's a perfect candidate we all think he's a flawed mm-hmm. vessel but but speak to this war on the individual in american society wow is that a good one yeah the collectivism uh i have a listener who's a college student in a junior college she's an older woman who went back to school so she, she knows what's going on. But she emailed me. She sent me a, um, a link to what is being taught in her history class. She couldn't believe it. They're using comic books as were. I looked at the comic book. It's shocking, but they're identical to what was published in Cuba under the Castros. Every comic panel shows an angry white person and a poor, oppressed person of color who's being harmed by the white person. This is in an American history class in college where they're using comic books to reach the adults in the school. And I said, it's that bad? They're using Soviet-era propaganda in our colleges? And they're giving kids Ds? I know another young woman who went back to school who comes home crying every day. She's a white girl in a, a college in Santa Monica. Her father is a very heroic Iraq war veteran. Her mother is a nurse in the military, had to be called back in her 50s. So she comes from a, uh, you know, a Western family, grew up on a ranch. They're real Americans. They're like tremendous people. She said every day she's berated. The white race is attacked every day in the classroom. Whites are bad. Whites are evil. White des- whites destroyed the world. Whites are destroying the environment. Whites are bad for animals. People of color are good. People of color are sensitive. This is a, a, a drumbeat day and night, day and night, day and night, day and night. Can this ever be changed, Alex? This brainwashing, this hatred that has poured out of the gutters of America because of the most divisive president ever possible. He's the one who did this. Make no mistake about it. This unleashing of hatred didn't come from nowhere. So l- let's get down to brass tacks. Is he the only problem? He's the main problem. But I call liberalism the philosophy a mental disorder, and I blame it for the disintegration of of the cohesion that gave America the backbone to conquer fascism in the Second World War, and also the backbone to, to outlast the Soviet Union in the Cold War. And I believe that the classical foundations of Western civilization are frankly superior to whatever else is out there. Yet I denounce U.S. multinationals like Facebook. Why is he outsourcing tech jobs? Why? Because he's a greedy, greedy man. And he should be taken down under antitrust legislation, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, How about the bipartisan tradition of elected officials that go on to enrich themselves uh, when they get out of office? How about that? So, yeah, we got a big, big problem ahead of us. Uh, It's interesting you bring up Facebook because you also have a, a powerful section in the book on some of these giant corporate tech companies, be it Google, be it Facebook, be it uh, YouTube, all of these, they're, they're all working for this globalist agenda. They're undermining the American citizen, and they're doing it in concert with both political parties in Washington, D.C., uh, and a lot of them are going to try to censor the content. They are censoring the content. Uh, uh, they're, they're, they're downplaying stories that our audiences might enjoy and react to and respond to. And they're promoting ones that the social justice warrior crowd will respond to. How big of a threat do you think this is for our democracy? Mark Zuckerberg's company is more powerful than some small countries by a large margin. He's running a nation. He's not running a company. He's become a transnational nation. His presence is stronger than that of most African nations. say, great, good for him. Don't we live in a free market? Shouldn't people be allowed to... uh, to uh, do what they want to do in business and survive. I hear that from all of the, the, the people who, who don't understand that our nation has antitrust legislation. And it was established in order to prevent monopolies from emerging, crushing competition. And Alex, remember the populist, Teddy Roosevelt, 
One of his campaign slogans was bust the trusts. He swore that when he became president, he would break up Standard Oil. He'd break up the railroads under Rockefeller because he controlled all the railroads in America. He wanted f competition. That's the cornerstone of, a, of, of a free market capitalism. Yet the antitrust division of Barack Obama has not been activated against Facebook, Google, and the other monopolies of our time. Why? Because they support him and his Prague policies. There are many fascist states that crush opposition viewpoints, censoring you on Facebook, uh, and so on. And yet, there is an antitrust division specifically to stop this from happening. No, no corporation can be permitted to become this powerful that starts to control the population. So yeah, we have a problem, and um, if Trump wins, if he still talks to me, and I can still reach him, which is becoming increasingly unlikely, who knows, maybe with, uh, with Steve there, something good will come of it. I would strongly advise that he really reactivate the antitrust division of the Justice Department and break up these, these monopolies and permit competition to emerge. Uh, Dr. Michael maybe... Savage, the book is Scorched Earth, Restoring the Country After Obama. It's on sale now. You can get, you can get an audio book. You can get a hardcover. You can get it uh, on your Kindle device, etc. Also, you could check out Teddy and Me, which is his picture book with his, uh, a lot of it's autobiographical. A lot of it has to do with his dog. I'm a huge dog picture guy, personally, so that resonates with me, Dr. Savage, on another level, aside from the, from, from, from the political stuff. Uh, the last question for you I had was just your overall commentary on why you wrote the book and why you feel like this is your last salvo uh, in terms of trying to save this country with these values. Hmm. Interesting. I've said on my show that this is my last political book. And, and look, by all estimation, Scorched Earth is already going to be a bestseller and with huge competition, with no appearances on Fox, no appearances in any media whatsoever, with the exception of this program and very few others, uh, if I can say Alex Jones, the Drudge Report, you know, linked to it. It'll probably be in the top five of new nonfiction uh, hardcover, even though I'm fighting huge, huge competition with no, no media exposure. It's astonishing how blacklisted I am and that people still go into the bookstores and buy my books. But say, well, why don't you continue? If you're going to still be on the radio, why don't you write another one next year? Well, the answer is I've done my, my job with this. And my first published book, 1972, was called Earth Medicine, about Native American Indian uh, remedies and foods, something I was fascinated with. My last nonfiction in this area is going to be uh, from Earth Medicine to Scorched Earth, Earth to Earth. Why? Because I've done it. I don't want to do it again. Let someone else do it. You know, I believe in competition. <laughs> There's plenty of people out there who are able to do it. What I want to do is I want to write about God. I don't have a lot of years that I can consider myself to be this functional or great in my ability to communicate. And I really have an obligation to do what's really underneath the surface of it all. I'm not a particularly religious man. I'm not going to pound the Bible and suddenly do a Glenn Beck on you. I don't have a church behind me or a synagogue behind me. Uh, uh, but I believe that God's hand has given me what I have, despite all obstacles, all the impediments that were put in my way. I have an obligation to spread some core beliefs that I have in another way. And I, that, that's what I want to do. I mean, I can't do everything. You know, I, I can't do a political book and a God book. I want to do a God book. Let's put it that way. Because if Trump wins... What am I going to write about? How bad Trump is that he didn't do what he said he would do? If Hillary wins, I think it's going to take more than a book to save ourselves. Let's put it to you that way. I don't think books are going to matter too much under the emerging progressive fascist dictatorship. I wouldn't be surprised if we don't have book burnings, but we'll have book bannings, see? Like they want to ban Breitbart? Why not ban a certain book that they consider not to be in the best public interest? Wouldn't that be a progressive value? Isn't that the way it's done in North Korea? And while we're at it, why not make it really progressive and eliminate the secret ballot? After all, that way people might actually vote the way they believe they should vote instead of the way that they're expected to vote in a union or anywhere else. So have a non-secret ballot where you actually have to prove who you voted for. That way you'll have 100% voter turnout and 100% votes for progressives. Isn't that a progressive value, uh, Alex? Isn't that where they're taking us? 
That's well, it's where they took the union, certainly. Dr. Michael Savage, thank you so much. You're so generous with your time. Uh, best of luck with the book. Also signed another deal, so he'll be on the air for a few more years to come. He's got uh, several books out. The latest is Scorched Earth, National Radio Hall of Fame Award as well. Well, you're on fire, Dr. Savage, so hopefully your passion will translate into the ballot box. But who knows? Are people too tuned out? We're going to continue to monitor that at Breitbart News and Breitbart News Daily on the Sirius XM Patriot Channel number 125.